Uh, thanks to the organisers for having me. And yeah, I'm Jake. I'm a PhD student at the IOA in Cambridge. And I'm going to be talking today about uh, some work from a paper that came out last year and one that's upcoming uh, looking at um, the intercluster medium and the primordial intercluster medium at quite high resolution. Um, we've heard lots of introductions about what galaxy clusters are, so I'm going to skip through to the simulations that I use in this, which are the Fable Suite um, from Nick Hendon. Um, so we have 27 zoom-ins of groups and clusters from about kind of large groups of 10, 5 times 10 to the 13 up to clusters of 2, 3, 4, 5 times 10 to the 15 solar masses. And we run that using a repo and an updated version of uh, the illustrious galaxy formation model with an updated uh, AGN feedback and stellar feedback model. And I'm going to be talking about two different samples within that now. So the first is uh, the full Fable sample, which has a gas resolution of about 10 to the 7 solar masses, which is usually reasonable for um, kind of the cluster simulations in general. Um, which we've used to look at how the hydrostatic mass bias evolves uh, through time. And there's a smaller subset sample that we've re-simulated with a new shock refinement scheme, uh, which boosts resolution to about 10 to the 4 solar masses, which we used to study, well, this, what I was originally looking at, the circumgalactic medium of massive high redshift galaxies, but which is effectively the primordial intracluster medium. Um, but kind of considering first the hydrostatic mass, um, kind of the key points are that from uh, X-ray observables, uh, we can, uh, can get density, we can derive density and temperature profiles from um, observations of clusters. And from the scenario of Zeldovich effect, we can estimate pressure profiles. And if you then assume spherical symmetry and hydrostatic equilibrium, you can then estimate cluster mass. Um, for example, using uh, the formula up here, uh, if you assume everything spherical and vaguely static. But um, that isn't often the case. I mean, as you can see from uh, this high redshift cluster on the right here, um, it's not quite spherical. And there are a lot of shocks going on from various sources, uh, whether it be merger and accretion shocks or from AGN feedback, for example. Um, all of which drives our sources of non-thermal pressure. I'm not going to talk about magnetic fields or cosmic rays at this point, but it's mainly turbulence, which is driven by mergers and AGN, uh, which is extremely common. And all of those things can see, serve to bias the mass that you estimate from galaxies. Um, so kind of, I'm going to skip kind of the, the methods, but we estimate uh, our masses in a similar way to, uh, to many other works. Um, and we find that our bias estimates for an ensemble average of the whole sample agree reasonably with uh, those from other simulations shown in this kind of uh, ensemble plot on the right. Um, we potentially you can say you might be able to find a decrease in the mass bias for larger masses of halos, but our sample is quite small and there is a large scatter. In all works, pretty much there's a large scatter. Um, you can kind of see in some of the individual uh, halos that we see here in the ones that have empty symbols are classed as morphologically disturbed through the, um, in their X-ray emission. And they tend to be, not always, but they tend to be kind of some of the more extreme bias values that you find. Um, but kind of as a broad picture, we find the 10, 20% hydrostatic mass bias on average that lots of other people find. But if we're kind of looking at a specific case study though, I'm going to zoom in on one particular halo uh, undergoing a major merger. So this is a halo that becomes about 10 to the, one time or two times 10 to the 15 solar masses at redshift zero. Well, this is at redshift 1.35. Uh, we see the pr main progenitor of this is in the center of all of these panels. And coming in from the right is uh, a major merging cluster with a mass ratio of about two to one. Um, and you can see, kind of a highlighted with this dotted line that there is this bow shock as the merger comes in. You kind of see in the wake of it there's an increased temperature and um, higher turbulent velocities and you can kind of start to see structures in the uh, in these unsharp mask images of uh, x-ray emission and the SZY parameter. Um, and so yes you can see it coming in uh, from the right hand side 
and passing through the R200 at this point. Uh, and because the temperature changes when you, a merger passes through, that can start to influence the temperature profiles and therefore the mass that you infer from those. And if also, interestingly, if you look at the very center, uh, the AGN has just gone off um, as it does from time to time. And it has, uh, the blast wave from that is passing outwards at that point. Um, and you can see it quite sh as a sharp feature in these unsharp mask images in the S7 and the X-ray. Um, again, the, suddenly you'll end up with these temperature jumps from the strong shocks uh, that will cause uh, bumps in your temperature profile that will again couldn't lead to changes in the mass bias. And if you come further in time after the cluster merging cluster has passed through once, we can kind of end up with a strong merger shock here on the left hand side, again associated with uh, a temperature jump and in the wake of it, kind of strong turbulent velocities um, and again, a strong feature in the X-ray and X-ray and SZ maps. But you see all over the place, there are these sharp features from shocks, whether it be from previous AGN outbursts or from mergers or from the next merger that's on its way, it's, it's a mess. So if we actually look at how the bias evolves during this time, um, we can see that uh, this is all R200. So this is at, um, the virial radius ish. Um, and as it progresses over time from redshift three down to redshift zero, the bias is up, down, up, down, it's all over the place. Uh, it's kind of very rarely at the 20% that you kind of would say is the usual value people come out with. It is sometimes there, and if you average over all time, it's reasonable, but it's jumping about all over the place. And if we kind of correlate that here, so this, this is the case study we were looking at is at this time here at redshift 1.3 down to one. Um, and as the halo comes in, you get this drop in the estimated mass, which corresponds to an increase in the bias. And then as the um, halo passes into the center and you get this shooting up of the, uh, shoot, well, shooting up of the mass, decreasing the bias again, which corresponds with the centroid shift here where it becomes disturbed. And this is where you get your big jumps in thermal pressure here and non-thermal pressure from turbulent velocities shown in red here, or if you estimate it from the velocity dispersion here in this yellowy color. Um, so yeah, we find that the bias changes a lot. Um, I'm not gonna go through each individual line here, but we also tried estimating with a pressure fit as opposed to just from the raw pressure profile. And we find sometimes that gets a bit inaccurate post-merger, uh, but that's kind of an aside for now. So this is at R200. If we go further into the halo, this is at R500, we find an even more extreme uh, example that the bias is jumping about all over the place. Again, when this major merger occurs, you find this drop followed by a jump up. That kind of structure holds. But um, even uh, where before there, was, there wasn't as much structure in this part, at R500, the bias is jumping up and down throughout this time. Interestingly, if you plot uh, the gas flows on this bottom panel here, which is a mass flux in and out in blue and orange, uh, blue and red respectively, we find that the time scale of these bias jumps corresponds to roughly where outflows dominate over inflows, which is generally because of AGM feedback. So we seem to find potentially the AGM feedback in Fable is a bit too strong as it has been in the lustrous, et cetera. But we find at least that the estimated uh, mass bias you get can correlate with both mergers and AGN driven outflows. Um, and if we look at actual non-thermal pressure that you actually get at this point, it depends on how you estimate it as uh, Franco Batzer has found amongst other people. Um, and so if you do use uh, velocity dispersions like in this dashed line, you end up with a much higher estimate of non-thermal pressure fraction than you do if you use turbulent velocities. But the general trend is we find the similar thing. They increase as a function of radius roughly out uh, just beyond the burial radius, but and they decrease as a function of time towards redshift zero. You end up with thermal processes dominating much more um, as you go to lower redshift. However, this seems to be, from previous work that I'm about to talk about, to be resolution dependent. 
uh, which brings me to kind of some previous work I've worked on, which is what happens when you boost the resolution. Thank you. Uh, this is what happens when you boost the resolution around a halo. Um, so this is a, a massive halo at Redshift 6. And you've, so this on the left is the same resolution as the Fable simulation I've just been showing. And on the right is where you boost it by a factor of 512. And you can get, start to pick out a lot more structure. Um, and kind of in the effect of uh, actually what you happens in thermodynamically, you get a lot more cold gas embedded within the hot halo. A lot of it coming from metal pore primordial filaments penetrating through. This is a high redshift. Um, but also you get kind of cold clouds condensing out of the hot halo. So you develop a much more multi-phase CGM, um, which is kind of would eventually, this is what becomes the intracluster medium of a, uh, a higher of a galaxy cluster uh, later on, as this is at Redshift 6. If we look at velocity dispersion and turbulent velocities, we find when we boost resolution, we get a significant increase in that too, particularly in the wake of accretion shocks here around the edge and in the center where filaments penetrate in and then shock. Um, so you get much higher turbulent velocities at the same spatial scale um, when you increase the resolution of the simulation. And if we look at that in terms of actual pressure support, you end up with um, a significant increase in the non-thermal pressure support you estimate just by changing the resolution. Um, so this green dash line here is the non-thermal pressure support in this Redshift 6 halo for a Fable resolution, base resolution uh, halo. When you increase the resolution by a factor of 512, that increases from uh, 10, 15% up to 30%. And so you, this could imply that uh, we ha could have implications for the mass bias that you estimate. Um, unfortunately, that's something I'm still working on at the moment uh, with a, a, a refined subsample coming down to lower redshift, um, but it has potentially quite interesting implications. And I think I'm probably about out of time. So I will leave you with my conclusion slide. Sure.